Welcome. I'm so happy to see you all here. And what a turnout. Uh, this is just so exciting to see so many people. Um, thank you to Swati and Sabrina and to Mia uh, for the introduction and for organizing and to everyone from PILA, the program in law and public service and the public service center um, who worked so hard to put this event together. It's going to be a great event. Um, so I spoke at orientation about the responsibility and obligation that come with the power of being a lawyer uh, and the privilege and the opportunity of being a lawyer and, um, and that you are empowered to make change in the world and that you are fortunate to have the tools, the education, and the resources to do so. The fact that you are standing here means you already feel the obligation of being a lawyer. You are already thinking about how you're going to serve the public. Um, and this event really is all about providing you with resources and information about how you can start doing that immediately and throughout your time uh, at the law school as well as beyond. It is our goal to help you fulfill your public service dreams in every way that we can. Uh, and I hope you look around here this evening and see not only your classmates and your peers and 2Ls and 3Ls, but also so many students, alumni, administrators, faculty, uh, members of the LAGC staff, uh, uh, and community who all consider ourselves uh, part of this public service community. And I will say, I am proud to consider myself a part of it too. Many of my most significant law school experiences were public service experiences, were uh, the prison clinic that I was a student in, my extracurricular activities, working with a prison project and a migrant farm worker legal aid, my summer spent at the NAACP LDF, a rural legal aid, and the Southern Center for Human Rights. These were critical to my development uh, as a professional, as a lawyer, uh, to my thoughts and understanding of the law, and to um, uh, judgment and integrity that I learned in those, uh, in those roles and in those interactions. So I consider myself part of our public service community, if you'll have me, um, and I have been so thrilled at the growth in our programs and support uh, over the last uh, 15 years or so. We really do have a, career, a, a classroom through career public service uh, program that consists of financial, academic, personal, communal, and professional support. You're going to hear details about all of those pieces uh, in a minute from all of the people who run them. Uh, we have especially been focused on increasing our financial support over the last couple of years, but we continue to think about how to improve and expand our program to make sure that everyone is able to take advantage of it and to pursue the public service careers of their dreams. So I hope you'll continue to generate ideas about what that might look like. This commitment to public service, the resources we spend are fairly new and modern part of the law school's history, um, but the commitment is not at all new. This law school was founded to create public servants and leaders for uh, this democracy uh, and promoters of justice and the rule of law. Over our two century history, who is imagined as being those leaders, those public servants and those lawyers has changed radically, but the idea that we are continuing to uh, to educate students for service has not really changed. Um, the way that our graduates serve, I think, has expanded. Um, we continue to have, as we have had for many decades, legal aid lawyers, prosecutors, public defenders, elected officials who graduate into those jobs. In addition, our graduates go on to work at Federal Reserve Banks, at think tanks, at NGOs, as climate action crusaders, as JAG lawyers, as impact litigators. And over time, there have been so many alums who now work in public, servants, in public service and who are public leaders that there are too many to name. Um, but it is suffice it to say that we have a long and storied past of public service uh, as well as a bright future. Um, in my view, when I think about the mission of our law school, we have a three-part mission. One part is to educate you all. A second part is to create new knowledge and discovery and help improve the law. And a third part is public service. That is a, a full third part of our mission. Uh, and I think that's true because I think every law school has a mission of public service. I think every public law school especially should have a mission of public service. And I think especially this one, which was created to serve the public, uh, has such a mission. So you could not have chosen a better place or a better time. There is a lot of need to educate yourself to become 
uh, public servants, we are so glad that you have chosen UVA and so excited to support you during your time here and once we launch you on your careers, which I know you are in your first week of school. So it's hard to imagine that we're already thinking about your careers after you graduate, but we are, I know you are too, uh, and we are thrilled uh, to see where you will head. So it is now my honor and privilege to introduce two people who have dedicated their professional lives to public service here in Charlottesville. Harold Foley Jr. is the Senior Supervising Organizer with the Civil Rights and Racial Justice Program at the Legal Aid Justice Center here in Charlottesville. In his role, he organizes and strategizes with a coalition of racial justice groups, nonprofit organizations, and individuals on the front lines of racial justice in Charlottesville. Harold has many years of experience as a community organizer and leader. He has worked on national, state, and local issues as an organizer with Virginia Organizing, a nonpartisan statewide grassroots Roots organization dedicated to challenging injustice. He spent four years as a community organizer with the Charlottesville Public Housing Association of Residents, FAR. You will hear about that, I'm sure, in the conversation, and we'll hear about it more generally in Charlottesville, whose mission is to educate and empower low-income residents to protect and improve their own communities through collective action. And he's also coordinated the West Haven After School Program for eight years, helping to create a safe learning environment for the children of Charlottesville's West Haven community. Wyatt Rolla first joined LAJC immediately after law school graduation in 2013. They've had many roles at LAJC, attorney for the Economic Justice Program, housing team coordinator, attorney and then interim director of the Civil Rights and Racial Justice Program, and now serves as the senior movement attorney at LAJC. Wyatt's work involves the blending of legal and organizing tools to make positive change. A graduate of the College of William & Mary, and I'm proud to say, of this law school in 2013 and one of my own students. Wyatt's career has, like Harold's, been dedicated to helping communities and individuals leverage legal and other tools to make such change. Outside of their work at LAJC, Wyatt has also served as a founding member of the National Lawyers Guild of Central Virginia, a member of the Advisory Council for the Charlottesville Public Housing Association of Residents, and is a lecturer and clinical instructor here at the law school to the great benefit of our students. A great deal of my own work as a legal historian has been studying how many people it takes working on different levels and in different parts of the legal change process to make change in our society. And as I said at orientation, we often think of only national figures out there making change in the world, the, the, the famous people uh, on the national stage. But as Wyatt's and Harold's careers show us, all of us have the capacity to make change in the world. All of us have the capacity to make our own communities better, more just, and more equitable places, to participate in the kinds of transformations that get written down in the history books. I am so delighted and so honored to have Wyatt and Harold with us this evening. There is so much we can learn from them about their work to affect change locally and at the state and national levels. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Harold Foley and Wyatt Rolla. My name is Wyatt. Mike Check, my name is Harold. This is a lot more people than were in this room when I was a 1L, I'm just gonna say that. Um, so a joint keynote is a little bit odd. Harold and I actually asked each other, we're like, have you ever seen a joint keynote? And both of us were like, nope. So, um, but that's okay, because we work every day um, trying to build something that's also kind of new, um, which is a deep partnership between lawyers and organizers, um, and you know, not just theorizing about that, but again, like practicing that every day. So what that means to us is we both believe that the people closest to the problem are frequently the experts on the problem. And it also means that what we think makes deep, lasting change is the collective effort of many, what folks will call ordinary people. Um, so we're gonna do the best to model the partnership of lawyers and organizers that, uh, that we think is necessary for that kind of change. Um, in our talk today, what we're gonna do is actually have a conversation with each other. We're gonna talk to each other about kind of what brought us to this work, what put us on the path, um, what sustained us on this path, and then if someone would be generous enough to tell us how much time we have, we'd love to open it up to you all to have a conversation with you as well, because um, we'd love for this to be, um, be collective if we, have, if we have time for that. So um, yeah, with that said, Let's Harold, do it. Are you ready? Yes. Ready for the first question? Okay. So Harold, um, what lit the fire for you of, of becoming an organizer? So what lit the fire for me was um, uh, uh, my life hasn't been so 
cut and dry. Um, I spent some time in the federal institution for selling drugs. And when I got there, what I noticed was um, uh, from Charlottesville, you don't see too many uh, folks that were black or you don't see too many over white folks at the time. And so when I got um, locked up and they sent me to prison, I noticed it was so many black folks there. And I was like, why is it so many black people here? And I think that what initiated my organizing because I looked up the population of black folks in the United States and it didn't match the population of the prison. And so right there, I, I um, automatically said, I have to do something about this. And what I did was I took the time that was locked up to figure out how to get back out and do things that it will help my community, not harm my community. So that would, would initiate the fire under my feet to want to do better for my community and make my community a better place. So my question to you, um, what triggered you to become a lawyer? Yeah, so when we were drafting these questions, obviously, it really struck me that I've thought a lot about what it was that drew me to change work or to, to movement work. And, you know, I could tell a lot of stories about that. I grew up as a gender nonconforming queer person in the South. Um, I grew up in a union family. Both my grandparents were union members. My grandfather was a garment worker. The other one was a union railroad worker. Um, but, you know, I haven't thought as much about what it was that made me decide to be a lawyer. So I really pondered this <laughs> to answer it for you all. And I, I think, so I graduated from college um, to age myself in 2008. So there weren't a lot of folks remember. That was the Great Recession. So, you know, there weren't a lot of job opportunities knocking the door down. And I remember I bought an LSAT prep book, like right when I graduated college. It was orange. And I was reading it. And I was really, I think I just had this sense that I might be good at being a lawyer. When you said, like, what drew me to it? I was like, OK, I, um, Harold knows I'm wonky. I like systems. I like to tackle a problem. I really like to read and write. Um, so that really drew me. But I also, I had this really deep ambivalence um, because I, I just, the legal system was so, at least where I had been in the South, had been so removed from the kind of change work that I had found most impactful. And I realized I actually didn't know any lawyers that had been involved in the campaigns that I had worked on. Um, so I shelved my book. <laughs> um, I moved to Richmond, um, and I worked as, oh, I waited tables, I was a personal trainer, I made people coffee, I painted houses. Um, but I also did a lot of unpa unpaid organizing work. And Harold and I actually met each other many years ago um, before we worked at LAJC. So kind of the two biggest things that really um, gripped me during that time, I worked for a grassroots abortion fund as an intake counselor, connecting people um, who needed abortion to financial grants to access those medical services. And I worked organizing tenants in a public housing community in Richmond, a group called Reframe, Residents of Public Housing of Richmond Against Mass Eviction. I promise this is coming back to lawyers because LAJC actually um, was staffing those meetings, the Reframes meetings. So I would go to them and Pat Levy Lavelle, who is now my coworker, um, would be at these meetings and he would take notes on flip charts. Pat's very, um, he's like a very humble genius. You might, if you take the employment clinic, you, you will meet him. Um, and if someone had a question, he could, name the regulation, whatever the, pu the public housing, notice that was applicable. Um, but he was very much um, a, a technician in the change efforts for, that were led by the residents. And I just remember, I remember a distinct day where Pat was taking his bicycle and he had pampers balanced on the cross beams and was for his kid and was biking home. And I was like, I, I think I could be that kind of lawyer. Um, so that, that kind of seeing that what organizing in law could look like was what made me be like, okay, I can pick that book back up and feel comfortable with it. So Harold, um, being an organizer is not easy. I have seen you in many conflicts. Um, what was the hardest part of learning to become an organizer and do the work that you can do today? I think the hardest part is understanding that people are different. Right, understanding that people come to the table with different skills and different attitudes, right, and how to weave them together. Um, I think the hardest part, though, for me is conflict, um, because what one of my um, People's Coalition members would say: we need conflict to be able to overcome what we're doing, and that's conflict inside. But <clears throat> when that conflict do come, it's really. Uh, uh, 
hard to deal with sometimes because you don't want to, you know, piss anybody off or say, you know, you can't be here no more. Because I, what I believe is that people bring every 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 person brings something to the table. You know, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, uh, when I try to get people involved, you know, people always say, I don't have the time, I don't have, I can't do this, uh, or I really want to do this. I always tell people, well, can you bake me some cookies and bring it to the meeting, all right? Because once they get into the meeting, they'll bring cookies for the rest of their lives coming to the meeting, all right? But uh, I don't want them to bring the cookies, come to a meeting, and, and get involved with the conflict. And the first thing that I do when, when it's a conflict, because conflicts does, do, do happen, the first thing I do is trying to resolve it, and then after the meeting or something, I will definitely call both the parties and see why the conflict was happening. But, but it gets really, uh, um, um, sometimes conflict get really so bad that you, sometimes you, know, you think those folks are gonna fight, right? Um, but what it is is people are so passionate about the bullshit that's been happening to them so, many, so much in their life that they're ready to do something about it. And they feel like sometimes you can't do anything about it because sometimes the lawyers say, hey, we gotta slow down, right? And then sometimes the, the, the community folks say, hey, lawyers, we need to slow, slow down. So it's some conflicts between community members, but so also it's conflict between lawyers. And, but what, I, what we have found out at LAJC is we understand that there are gonna be conflicts. And the people that I work with, Teresa is one of the best persons I know um, to help with resolving conflict sometimes, right? So I have to lean on folks also to help me figure it out. But conflict is the most, I mean, it's like <laughs> you at a meeting, you're in a meeting, can you imagine? You're in a meeting, the meeting going well, then all of a sudden the meeting just blow up. You know, people cussing each other out, you know? Um, and so that's, I think that's the most difficult part of being an organizing organizer, how to resolve those conflict on the fly. So, um, what is the hardest part of, about learning to be a lawyer? Lawyers get in a lot of fights too, but I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna choose that. Um, I think, especially since many of you all are 1Ls, the hardest part for me of learning to be a lawyer was actually learning the nuts and bolts of practicing, like, there are a lot of tech, you will have to learn a lot of black letter law things. You will have to learn client interviewing. You'll have to learn what it takes to like file a lawsuit in state court, which you know you will not learn in law school. Um, and it's a lot, of, a lot of things, right? And at the same time for me, I was trying to wrestle with what my role as a lawyer should be to make change. And kind of having, I, I, f I feel like, um, I used to tell people sometimes it felt like it's like you're playing chess in the middle of a bar fight. It's like, these like high volume legal services and then having this other running thing in my brain about like what is the appropriate role for me and how can I support communities in making change. And actually I, I remember I asked a, a lawyer and a civil rights lawyer in town when I would, had grad, my fellowship was in Charlottesville and it was actually doing individual case reps. I did eviction defense, I did conditions cases, and I also um, was general counsel for the Public Housing Association of Residents. So I was um, representing a tenant organization. And I asked him basically, will you be my like movement lawyering mentor? And he said to me, I think you should just learn how to be a lawyer first. And I, I mean, I understand the impulse, but I also, I was, I was up in it already, right? Um, like those questions came up every day and how I should relate to my clients and like, you know, are they even my clients? They're really residents, right? What does it mean to show up and have a broader relationship with them that doesn't have that power dynamic? Um, so I think one of the things that I would to, you know, sneak in a piece of advice or tip before we get to that section is I really valued the uh, seminar courses and independent studies I did in law school that allowed me to wrestle with that question when I had the time and intellectual space to do it. And I'd thought a lot about it by the time I actually started practicing. Like, what is my theory of change? What do I think lawyers' role in social movements should be? Um, and how do I envision doing that? And I think um, that helped me, but that was still really hard. I think that was the hardest part for me of trying to, um, you know, just understand how to also be a technical lawyer, right? You also want a lawyer who's gonna answer your question correctly at the same time as you want a lawyer who is gonna um, not be heinous to work with. Um, so, Harold, 
you just mentioned conflict, people yelling, screaming, using profanity. I've seen all of these things. Um, in light of all that, like what, what makes this sustainable for you? Harold has been doing organizing work for, I mean, close to two decades, over two decades, close, close to two decades. What makes this work sustainable for you? Well, I think what makes the work uh, sustainable for me is seeing people move up the leadership ladder, right? When, you know, I talk about, you know, someone coming in and just saying, I want to bake cookies. But to see that person go from baking cookies to writing a letter to the editor, to sitting down to talking to a letter state about what is their problem, to, you know, becoming, you know, a leader in their own community. That was, that is what makes me, um, to give me the fuel to keep going because, um, you know, uh, I could tell you a story about the People's Coalition. That's the coalition that I facilitate. We um, started our journey in trying to get a police oversight board here in Charlottesville in 2018. Um, and by 2019, uh, you know, uh, the People's Coalition um, was the force in helping create the bylaws and the audience for this, um, this oversight board. And the, in 2019, city council shot it down and said, we are a dealing room state and we can't do this. We gotta get permission from the um, letter state of the General Assembly. And what was amazing to me is in the pandemic, the People's Coalition decided to keep doing it, keep going to the letter staters, keep having those conversations. I'm talking about folks who never been in a room with a letter stater having conversations with letter staters about how important it is to make sure police don't brutalize people living in black and brown communities. With that said, what happened was they passed in the General Assembly one, one, most of the, one of the most like, strongest oversight bill that Virginia ever had. Um, and it's up to really the letters, up to the localities to take it up, but it made the People's Coalition jail together, and believe me, it was some fights inside of there that sometimes, you know, I was like, oh my goodness. But then what happened was they fight, cuss each other out, come to the next meeting, it's like, what we gotta do now, right? But just seeing the, the, the emotion and passion that folks had for this bill was, or is, or have been what has keep me keep going into being Harold Foley, the organizer of the People's Coalition. Um, so, why? What sustains you, make you sustainable in your work that you do as a lawyer? Yeah, I think when I used to tell people, I think, like I said, I didn't think much about why I became a lawyer, but when I used to tell people, I, I felt like my elevator pitch answer would be like, I wanted to be a tool in the toolbox for change, right? I thought there were many different tools. I believe organizing is one of the primary ones, but I wanted to be like an Allen wrench for justice. Um, <laughs> and I, I think like that's true, but the more I thought about it, I think like the reason that what really drew me to this work is like I wanted that tool to be something that I could offer to people as a way to be in relationship to them, to say like, oh, you're trying to build that piece of Ikea furniture here. Like, I am, I am this thing that can help you with that. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I, I wanted to have relationships with those people, and I wanted to have relationships across all kinds of difference that are um, deeply de facto segregated and separated in our society still. Um, and those relationships are, are what sustain me. I think, like... I feel like there's a rhetoric around being a public servant, like, oh, you are sacrificing your big law firm salary and you are doing this thing out of the goodness of your heart. I mean, I do this because it makes me more human. I feel less alienated. I feel more grounded in the world. I like my life. That is why I do this. Um, and I feel sustained by those relationships. Like, I, I feel sustained by Harold. Like, I've, like, we've been in relationship with one another for, like, over a decade, right? And doing work together, and that, that really grounds me. So I think, that, I think that is what I would say. 